I see my PowerPoint. Um, so over the next 30 minutes, um, we're just going to go through some of the stuff that um, I, I see as a consultant dealing with customers that come up time and time again uh, around their migration to Microsoft 365 as a platform. Um, and it, a lot of the stuff is more prevalent today because we find ourselves in this uh, new strange world with, with COVID-19 and uh, a bit more of a rush on to get stuff out to the cloud. So just a little bit about me, first of all. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Morris Daly. Um, I'm a senior cloud architect with a company called Cloudway based out of Norway. Um, but I'm, I'm not obviously Norwegian. Um, I'm, I'm based in Ireland. Uh, for those who wouldn't I guess by my accent. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP in the area of enterprise mobility since 2017 and going back way before that uh, MCSE, uh, MCSA in uh, cloud platform. Feel free to reach out to me on any of the media there. Uh, I'm on Twitter a bit. Uh, I run a blog with a couple of other individuals um, called MSN Point Manager now. Uh, it was called scconfigmanager.com, um, but we rebranded. Re and you can email me as well afterwards. So for many, um, the Microsoft 365 platform is the promise of secure IT. We all have CIOs who've gone along to conferences or attended stuff like this virtually, and they get fed this story about Microsoft 365 being a secure platform. And of course it is. Um, you know, there are many features within the platform today, which um, go a long way beyond what your on-premise could ever do. Uh, and when we're talking about that, we're talking about scale and the ability to do so intelligently through the cloud. But things that we often focus on here and during the migration get overlooked. And we, we look at that, the high level items without understanding some of the security flaws that actually also go on in the background. Um, and, and we've seen that time and time again, particularly where our customers have gone down, say, the Office 365 route, first of all, and not understood about some of the um, security features that they don't get because they didn't have Azure AD Premium. Um, and of course, we, we've got a slight benefit there recently uh, being announced that uh, for Microsoft 365 business customers, so that's those with less than 300 users, they are now also getting AD Premium P1. Um, so they're getting some of the additional benefits that we'll see. But we're going to kind of cover some of these um, features today, and some are, yes, some are Azure ADP 2 But when we engage with customers, typically we, we talk about doing the bare minimum of, say, something like Microsoft 365 E3 plus the E5 security add-on for E3. Um, and the reason for that is about getting all of the intelligent cloud-driven security um, delivered to us uh, through our license. So traditional blockers um, that we see versus today's reality. When we deal with, with customers, we, we always kind of tend to hear this stuff over the past few years. Um, the view that the data must be maintained on site. Um, they have issues around about cloud security in general. Um, we hear a lot of that going back many years as, you know, arguments over whether we want to run ADFS rather than password sync uh, and so on. Uh, training, big thing, okay, we, we limited resources, limited IT departments, and they've dealt with, you know, Exchange, Active Directory for many years, and we're going to have to retrain them, we're going to have to retrain all of our users, um, and of course the enrollment process itself uh, requires a lot of training. Uh, device management is something that is for on-premise devices, Again, very much focused on what was in the office. Today, things have changed a lot. We're all working from home, and I think this is something um, in the future that we're going to see a lot bigger change in um, because it's no longer about that PC that you come in to use between the hours of you know, 8 a.m. to 5 or whatever your working hours are. It's about being productive wherever you are. Cost, of course, cost is always an issue. Um, you know, we, we don't set the, the pricing uh, points, but um, when, when you're looking at the, the infrastructure that you've invested in over the past number of years and you've paid off software licenses and 
then you look at moving all of that to the cloud. I don't think you should ever be sold the story that it's going to be cheaper uh, because it probably won't be. But if you look at the the benefit of it, um, it gives a lot of uh, cost uh, beneficial um, areas, it, it, particularly in terms of security. The the administrative effort to migrate data. Okay, again, another big thing. You know, we're, we're going to hold off because we have several terabytes of exchange data, or we have files across spread across file servers, folder redirection. How do we all do all this stuff to OneDrive? And then, of course, the whole world kind of flipped on its head uh, late last year or early this year for most of us when uh, COVID-19 was discovered. And all of a sudden, we're having the same discussions um, with, with customers on a daily basis, which is get all of our data into the cloud as soon as possible. Um, VPN solutions are being overwhelmed. Um, we've gone from clients who have had maybe a couple of hundred users logged in on a VPN at any one time to a couple of thousand users logged in at the VPN. And all of a sudden, they are seeing that that model isn't scaling the way they thought it would. Uh, software needs to be delivered to devices anywhere. So again, in contrast to what we did previously, where you know device management is always focused on premise, now it's any device, anywhere, anyone. So what do we need? We need a full MDM platform. Um, you know, and, and if you're using Configuration Manager, that's absolutely fine. And if you want to do code management or go into standalone, but the key point is we need to manage everything right now so that we can get over this crisis. And there we are. This needs to happen now. So this is the kind of conversation I'm having again and again at the moment with uh, customers and potential customers that are moving all of their stuff to Microsoft 365. But the trouble is, a lot of them aren't informed about potential issues that can happen. So I say, let's not be a crash test on me. Let's understand the security threat landscape that we're moving to, because it's not about just moving something from on-premise to another data center that's protected uh, by your perimeter firewall or stuff like that. It's a very different place. Um, so you have to think much differently. Uh, migration needs to be planned, not rushed. A uh, very important thing, a lot of companies at the moment, as I say, are literally tripping over themselves to get into the cloud to uh, fix something that um, is, is an immediate issue. But by doing so, you don't want to leave yourself open. So you need to understand the security risks and the tools that you have in, in Azure AD, for example, to help mitigate against these security risks. Licensing, yep, you, you need to license the features adequately, I said there, but really and truly what you want to do is, uh, particularly if you're going down the route of say, CSP licensing, is perhaps over license some of the users so that they are getting all of the security features turned on. And then you can look back afterwards and say, well, okay, perhaps I don't need that or this feature and you could scale it back. But all in all, um, as I said, the, you know, the E5 security add-on giving you Azure AD Premium P2 is probably where you would like your organization to be. And of course, the mistake that a lot of companies use, uh, uh, sorry, the mistake that a lot of companies go through is just because it's a trusted vendor doesn't mean security is always switched on. Um, we've seen stuff in the press over a number of years about companies who've moved to Office 365 because that was the platform of choice back then. Um, and all of a sudden have got you know, dealt with uh, issues from stuff like invoice fraud, um, all because they weren't told at the time about the, the features that should be turned on. So what are the numerous methods of attack today? Well, the obvious. Breach replay, password spray, and brute force are the ones that we typically see. And we're going to see them in the Azure AD logs kind of frequently if we leave them on. Um, dumpster diving, um, key logging, and phishing. Um, and the phishing in particular is something we'll focus on in the next few slides because it's still on the increase. And as I always say to, to customers, it, there's always one person in your organization who will click on anything you send them. Um, so you need to try to mitigate against that scenario. And something I just talked about a minute ago, 
it all resorts in something like uh, you know, invoice fraud or extortion. Um, because if you throw enough stuff at someone, uh, something will stick. And you know, this is a, a multi, multi million dollar um, business for companies, uh, or well, for not for companies, for for um, hackers and 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 fraudsters all around the world. So phishing, I mean, it, it's still a massive rising threat. Um, you know, as I say, there's always someone that will click on anything you send them. But the trouble is, um, when your identity is now the key thing in your organization, and it's no longer that VPN appliance or the firewall that you once had, um, you need to change your mindset to, to, to protecting the identity. And that's not just about passwords anymore. And then that's that's been done to death. Um, yes, there are, are, are mechanisms you should put in place to ensure passwords are complex and so on, you know, through automated processes, but, but not changing them so often. And, you know, Microsoft will actually tell you never change a password today uh, once certain things are in place. But um, if you send something and someone clicks on it, um, they're going to get fished. And from there, the kind of world is a door oyster. And we're seeing that phishing is getting more and more sophisticated. So 90% of the stuff that I get sent through to me, you kind of, if you're working in IT, you look at it and you laugh because you realize, okay, this is clearly a phishing attempt. Um, some of them are very poorly constructed. Um, but today we're actually seeing um, more sophisticated attacks in, in terms of uh, how the, the links are delivered in particular. So um, rather than a, a straight link and even being branded via by a, another method to make it look, say, like Microsoft or Amazon, DocuSign, whatever the case may be. Um, we're seeing that um, Google links and SEO is even coming into it so that, um, you know, as I say, when you go searching for something on Google for a download, well, the first one's always the best one. Uh, well, that's not always the case. Uh, and you could be duped into downloading something malicious quite easily by manipulation of uh, search engines. So the issues are, I mean, human nature and curiosity, of course. Um, I, I've spoke before about instances where, you know, someone will get an email and they'll, they'll go up to IT and they'll say, should I click on this? And IT will say no. And yet, lo and behold, they'll check the logs and that person went back and clicked on it. Um, but stuff you should train your users looking at is, some, I mean, I'll show an example of something in a minute, but um, branding and wording is, tends to try tends to give some of this stuff away uh, there'll be misspelling or the grammar it won't be correct um subtle de domain name and personalization is a, a a big thing at the moment that we see so um i, I just think of an incident with a customer last week where uh, an email came through um from a supplier they mail back they have frequent uh, exchanges with the supplier and um unfortunately that supplier um, obviously breached and they were doing something like SMTP forwarding um, to read mail flow conversations. And when an order was placed um, after the weekend, first thing Monday morning, they got an email out, uh, from the alleged recipient. Uh, however, when you looked at the domain name, it was very subtly different. Um, and, and then having to explain that to the customer, yes, that this domain was registered in such a country a couple of weeks ago, uh, they've obviously been looking at things um, and you should probably talk to your supplier at this stage. Um, but the potential of course is identity theft in terms of your virtual online identity, uh, hopefully not your, your actual physical identity, um, fraud and of course ransomware. Um, ransomware is probably something that we actually see less and less of at the moment, but um, it, it is a potential. So we have stuff like this. I mean, this is an email that went through. It seems completely legitimate. If you look at it briefly, um, you've got Microsoft branding, uh, even look at the email address if you were to glance over it. Uh, but then if you pay closer attention, uh, it's not Microsoft Online, it's Ms. Microsoft Online. Um, and this is how easy um, users can be duped into giving away their identity. And of course, it'll never happen to me. 
but it happens to nearly 1.7 million accounts in the past four months through a spray tax alone. So it does happen. Uh, and when we look at you know some of the other kind of statistics that are out there, we see that you know 7.1 million records are stolen every day, and another equates right down to uh, 82 a second. Um, so we, we can see that security breaches are a major, major thing that you need to protect yourself against. And of course, it goes right back, right up to the top of who's doing uh, the management of your your estate. So, you know, Microsoft 365. 20% any ideas what that would be um, and unfortunately it is the percentage of admins who have MFA enabled um, so global 80% of global admins out there um, have no form of or multi-factor enabled and they might have just used the default password they might have emailed it to someone and you know any any possibility is there for an attacker to get in um, and typically they'll sit in there for a couple of months with you never knowing, which is the, the really dangerous thing. And of course, then what happens when it did happen to you? Well, we're all going to say, why me? But we need to understand the risk. So Microsoft Azure security tools are not enabled, implemented or understood. A big thing. Uh, the license model was not sufficient to provide adequate risk protection. Again, probably more historic going back to that. Office 365 versus M365 debate, and probably now that they've renamed uh, the Office 365 licenses to all fall under M365, the boundaries become a bit more blurred. IT training was not prioritized, so we moved to this thing in the cloud and IT didn't have a clue. Um, yes, they knew how to manage Exchange Online because it looks similar to uh, Exchange 2013 or 2016, but aside from that, perhaps not. Legacy authentication was not discussed, blocked, or planned for. Um, one of the key attacks that we'll see always comes through uh, IMAP4 because it's a protocol that doesn't support um, conditional access. And these can all be fixed or planned for. So this is the main thing. So let's talk about some of the tools that we can implement in our arsenal here today. Well, we've got multi-factor authentication. It goes hand in hand with conditional access, of course, and even hand in hand with Azure AD password self-service reset. Um, so those three alone um, are, are very powerful to ensure that you know, you're coming from a uh, corporate device. Um, you're coming from something that is compliant with compliance policies. And of course, if something happens to your identity that you're able to mitigate against it uh, yourself, um, in, in, in real time. Um, Azure AD password protection, something that was out there for preview for quite a while, but obviously went GA, um, just protects against you know, character substitution and the uh, the top, I think, is 1.5 million most frequented passwords and, and exposed passwords that are out there. And that just goes to help ensure that you don't use something that's too easy. Um, there are other mechanisms you can use, such as biometrics through hello, um, and that should all be done as well. But, uh, you know, protecting the basics is, is key. Um, exchange authentication policies. Again, OK, one thing you could do, you could block IMAP and pop for everyone, uh, but they can still try to authenticate against you and to see if they can uh, at least get, gain some kind of success criteria. And then we've got other stuff in Azure AD, such as user risk policy, sign in policy, so that we can remediate against um, actions on the fly. We can request a multi-factor authentication prompt or force a password reset. And of course, the reason that we then promote the use of, say, E5 security add-on is you're going to get all of the advanced threat protections. Uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Defender ATP um, or Windows Defender ATP as it was called, uh, Azure ATP uh, and Office 365 ATP. But the kind of mistakes that we see being used done time and time again are uh, no tiered access groups. So we, we, you know, we, we could deal with the most security conscious firm in the, in the world, but move them to the cloud and all of a sudden uh, things run away with themselves where we have global admin accounts who, which are synced normal users, credentials and so on. Uh, we have no break the glass admin accounts. So if MFA goes down, um, we are in a bad place. Um, we have you know, the likes of uh, PIM not being implemented. So you could be licensed for it, but 
um, the ability to change control and see when someone's elevating themselves to a uh, administrator role uh, and ensuring that someone is always global reader is is not done. And you know, this is another thing that we we see all the time is no one's watching this thing. So there's a thing in the cloud that we've moved to. Um, we might have turned on a couple of security features, but we have no way of knowing what goes on because we, we end up looking at the dashboards. And if you leave the cloud app security dashboard uh, for a month or two, you might be inundated with the amount of information that's it's reporting back to you. But it's about setting up alerts um, so that, you know, for instance, if we're using a break glass admin account, that we know about it immediately because um, that's something that we shouldn't be using. Um, other things we can do, okay, we can monitor ransomware quite easily. Um, again, all done through MCAS, very easy to set up, built in template type, and we can have stuff like emails, um, text messages, or even likes of Teams push notifications coming up. Enforcing multi-factor authentication, conditional access for everyone. Um, I mean, with security defaults now, uh, it's going to be enabled for everyone. But it, it, if you need flexibility and you need to do something for yourself, you should be requiring um, this for all of your accounts that you can't do exclusions for. And, and, and it's really easy for the end user to set up. So when you're going through the likes of migration, get your users to enroll in, in Microsoft uh, MFA first so that they're not caught during the uh, the process of onboarding a, a device into Intune with their mobile and, and sitting there going, I need to scan this QR code, but I can't do that. Um, so it's kind of typical two to five minute process and they're done. Um, and that just gives them the ability then to ensure they are who they say they are by having that additional authentication method. And the kind of things that get pushed back about is, OK, users don't want to install an app, particularly if it's their personal device. And OK, we'll just use SMS or, or call based notifications. You know, that works perfectly well. It doesn't need anything on, on the end user device, but at least allows them to be protected. And of course, the, the mistake that we all made, I suppose, going back many years ago, uh, was we, we trusted our networks. We said, OK, we own this space on the Internet and we're going to protect uh, against everything outside of that. But of course, breaches can come from internal as well, so you shouldn't adopt a zero trust approach to uh, networks. So uh, blocking legacy authentication, it's the number one thing that we, we see time and time again. It's just not thought of. So we enable conditional access rules. Um, customers have got that in place. That's fine. But if you look at the Azure AD logs, you will see stuff still trying to authenticate against you know, the likes of IMAP, MAPI, uh, POP3. Um, so you can have rules that, that that go ahead and block, and we can set up exchange uh, authentication policies to basically uh, block all users, but allow some exceptions as well, or maybe a particular copy of software that you have running in your organization still requires IMAP access. We can we can cater for that, and in that case, maybe you might actually want to to uh, to allow access, but has some limitations on it. Uh, a password security and biometrics. Yeah, it, this has kind of been done to death, but we need to protect against it. So Azure AD password protection, great solution, very easy to implement. Uh, put your proxy in on your network and then set up the filters on the, on the domain controllers. And very quickly, you'll be able to protect your users against uh, poor password regimes going on in your, your uh, organization. And implementing Windows Hello for biometric or PIN. Um, one of the things that keeps getting asked, well, you've got us to do complex passwords and then, OK, you've, you're not asking to change this frequently, but now how is a six digit pin secure? Well, that is a token for your machine. It's not a token for somewhere else. And if, if we take the same analogy, look at the, the uh, device that's on your desk or in your pocket. It's a mobile phone. You typically have a four six digit pin on that and you had provided your password the same way. So you're actually basically having the same security on that device, which is a, a lot more mobile and a lot easier lost. Azure AD self service password reset. Why companies would not want the ability for their end users to reset the password is something we, we need to address. Um, 
if you disclose your your credentials unwittingly through some kind of phishing attempt, um, should it be up to the the end user to, to wait there until the IT department is maybe open the next morning, or should he be able to go in or remediate against that action safely and securely through multi-factor? And of course, yeah, the the key thing is without assistance from from IT, because today you yeah. You know, End users are consuming more and more things um, uh, through the cloud themselves outside of work. So they expect this kind of stuff to happen. Automate uh, user risk events. Um, again, so that if, if we say a high risk as, as access has um, occurred, um, we can very easily force password change on that user immediately. Um, so that we again protect it against their identities being used elsewhere. Implementing all of the, the Defender Suite. Um, again, this is a suite of products which is powered by the cloud, which can do a lot more than your on premise security uh, ever could when we take, you know, what was the tradition of. Um, the older style uh, AV and security products that we've all grown up with. Um, today, a lot of stuff is going on with the, in the cloud. And of course, Microsoft are using all the analytics around that to detect threats that are emerging um, and then reach back into even your on-premise machines um, via the likes of you know, Azure ATP, or we can look down your domain controllers and see if there's stuff like um, LDAP attacks going on or past the hash attempts. Uh, lateral access and so on. Um, we can use the uh, Microsoft Defender ATP for um, your Windows devices, so that if John, for instance, comes in and John uses Office 9 to 5 every other day, and all of a sudden he's using PowerShell scripts that are generating files, that you know about it and something can be remediated against automatically without you doing anything. And one of the things about people moving to Microsoft 365 is they actually tend to forget around about the uh, element of um, exchange security. So they forget, OK, well, I actually need a decent anti-spam filter. And by default, uh, typically it's not great. Uh, so you want to invest in, in ATP. You know, that way you're going to get safe links and safe attachments. Um, and of course, other things that you should do are likes of enabling DKIM. Uh, so your, your messages are cryptographically signed for the end recipient and so on. And there are, there are tools that you can use out there just to check uh, you're adhering to best practices. So if we take Exchange Online, uh, for instance, um, you know, prevention is best form of cure, and we can simply run the uh, a PowerShell um, module called Orca, um, which is the, uh, the Office 365 recommended configuration analysis report to very quickly identify holes in maybe the defaults that we can put in, in our, into our attempt. Um, and they'll step through each of those, how to remediate against the action, uh, and a very, very quick and easy thing to do. Monitor your dashboards. This is something that Microsoft has got a lot better with doing recently, um, visualizing stuff for, for the, the admins. Um, you know, I mean, the order forward and messages uh, thing is something that a lot of companies will need to pay attention to. Um, for, for the likes of you know, invoice fraud, where someone's breached identity and they're sending emails out to their own email, so they don't even need to be logged in. They're just monitoring what's going on. Um, but using the likes of you know protection.office.com or securitycenter.windows.com to see what's going on in, in your environment in real time. And of course, controlling device enrollment types. Um, again, something that we see all the time, but the ability to enroll a personal device isn't being blocked because we've got Windows MDM allowing personal devices. So if someone goes down to the, the local PC world or whatever, they come home, plug in their device, and they happen to put in their corporate credentials, they're actually enrolled in their device into your tenant. And depending on what policies you've got, all of a sudden you've corporate uh, corporate data sitting on a personal device. Um, and of course, we've got the likes of uh, Android Device Administrator. Um, again, I still see companies out there who have that enabled. Um, whereas today, you really want to be using at least the Android work profile uh, for segregation of data um, in a in a containerized version on, on your handset. 
The other bits that are there by default, uh, controlling guest access. So guests can invite other guests to your tenant to collaborate on work on your data. That is by default. That is something you should immediately go and remediate against. Um, no one likes the thought of someone they don't know working on a document that was shared out. Reviewing guest accounts periodically within Azure Active Directory. Um, again, uh, yeah, it's about controlling what users have access to. And once you've got all of those in place, um, you should be in a far better place today than you were yesterday. Uh, so that's only a, a couple of items that you need to do within the console um, to really secure your data. Um, and with that, you know, keep calm and secure and secure your data. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jorgen. I I think I just cut to the time as well where we're about to go off and all meet each other virtually. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, re I'm really looking forward to that conversation with myself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Thank you very much again.